What do living things have in common? They reproduce. They feed. They grow. They use energy. They communicate. They move. And most of them die. The other thing that's common to most of them is that they are made up of cells. They're studied with very powerful microscopes, which can magnify cells up to 500,000 times. Computers can enhance the images for even more detailed examination. Fluorescent dyes can be injected directly into individual cells to mark specific parts. All this technology can reveal a fascinating world of constant activity. For while whole organisms are going about their business, feeding, reproducing, growing and so on, most cells are doing exactly the same things. Watch this. It's an amoeba, a single cell. And this is it feeding. An amoeba can change shape easily. By pushing its cell surface forward, it engulfs its food. That's fine if you're a single-celled organism. But if you're just one cell, say in the middle of a mass of skin tissue, how do you feed? We need to know more about the structure of a cell before we can find out the answer to that question. This represents a typical animal cell. You might call it an average cell. A typical plant cell might look like this, a more rigid, regular shape. But bear in mind that cells come in many shapes and sizes. They don't all look like these. Water makes up around 60% of the cell because water is a favourable environment for the many biochemical reactions that take place inside. The typical cell has different structures within it. Perhaps the most familiar is the nucleus. All the structures, which are known as organelles, have specific functions and we're going to look at some of those functions in detail. The amoeba gets its food from outside the cell. Single cells in multicellular animals do the same. The food, or nutrients, may be carried in a fluid which bathes the outside of the cell, such as blood. In plants, vessels transport sap through the plant. It's highlighted here with fluorescent dye. The nutrients then have to get inside the cell, which means they have to cross a selective barrier, the cell membrane. It's a complicated structure. This is a scanning electron microscope, and it can reveal the structure of a cell in fantastic detail.
This is the outer surface of a cell. How does the food get through all that? Well, the membrane is selectively permeable. That is, it permits the exchange of water and other materials between the inside and outside of the cell. The nutrients are taken into the cytoplasm, which is a jelly-like substance on the inside. Here's part of a plant cell, with the cytoplasm moving just inside the cell boundary. It's known as cytoplasmic streaming. It helps nutrients to be circulated, but there's another system for that too. Different areas of the cell are connected by an intricate web of channels and tubules, the cytoskeleton and the endoplasmic reticulum. But the final destination for most of the food is an organelle that is often called the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondrion. Many cells contain hundreds of mitochondria. Here, they show up with fluorescent dye again. To see the structure, we have to look at the mitochondria with an electron microscope, which can look at a slice through the parts of a cell. The pictures, by the way, are always in black and white. Enzymes in the mitochondrion control a series of chemical reactions, during which nutrients like glucose are progressively broken down. In the final stages, oxygen is added. The waste products are water and carbon dioxide, but the main product is energy, and it's captured and stored until it's needed in the form of a molecule known as ATP. This whole process is called cellular respiration. Plants have organelles to do with energy that animals don't have, and it's something that makes them unique, because plants can capture energy directly from the sun. Plant cells contain chloroplasts. The chloroplasts contain a green pigment called chlorophyll, which absorbs the light energy. The energy is used to combine carbon dioxide and water to produce complex organic molecules, like sugars, for food. This process is known as photosynthesis. So, plants take in energy from the sun and use it to produce their own food. The food can then go into the cell respiration process we saw earlier. OK, so cells take in food and convert it to give themselves energy. But what is energy needed for? Well, all living things move. And believe it or not, many cells do the same. This is one of the largest single-celled organisms. It's called a tetrahymena. It has tiny cilia on its outer surface, which it moves to catch food. So it has to use energy to catch energy. Here's another type of movement. This is a trypanosome, and it moves by wriggling its body backwards and forwards.
but they are both single-celled creatures. Do cells that make up multicellular organisms move? Well, here are red blood cells. They're moving. But you could say they're just being carried along by the flow of the fluid. OK, well, how about this? This is a white blood cell, and it's not just being carried along. It can move in an amoeba-like way of its own accord, through blood vessel walls and between cells, to scavenge for invading microbes. We have thousands of white blood cells like this in our bodies. Then, of course, there are these, sperm cells, which have to be able to move to reach the female's egg cell. A sperm cell is equipped with a tail to move, and the energy is supplied by mitochondria packed into the base of the tail. But it has to be said, there are lots of cells that don't seem to move at all. So what did they use energy for? Well, an obvious use is this. Energy is needed for growth. That's easy to see looking at a big organism, be it animal or plant. But how is growth achieved at cell level? Well, in fact, individual cells don't really grow much themselves. They don't just get bigger and bigger. But they do have to copy themselves so that the whole organism can grow and function. The process is cell division and it takes up a lot of energy because it often has to happen at an astonishing rate. Take the growth of an elephant, for example. Kara began life at Chester Zoo as a fertilised egg. And remember, a fertilised egg is a single cell. By the time she was born, 21 months later, she had increased in weight 10 million times. At birth, she was around 120 kilograms and a metre high. That rate of growth must surely take a huge amount of energy. It does, and it occurs through the process known as mitosis. This is a cell about to divide. The ability of cells to divide is vital to the whole organism because it allows genetic information to be copied from one cell to the next. Here's what happens. The chromosomes line up along the middle of the cell. They're made of two identical copies, called chromatids. The chromatids move to opposite ends. The cytoplasm divides, and the other cellular material is distributed between the two new cells. Each one of the daughter cells is identical to the parent cell and each other with the same genetic information held in the nucleus, so they will function in exactly the same way as the parent cell. It's spring, and here's the next stage. Frog spawn. These are the cells of a frog, multiplying by dividing. Growth doesn't only occur when new animals and plants are being formed. It's a continuous process. Take the lining of your gut, for example. The cells in there have to take a continual battering from the food you eat. Not surprisingly, they don't last long and so have to be replaced by perfect and identical copies at the rate of 17 billion cells a day. In fact, the gut lining you have today is completely different to the one you had a week ago. So, cells grow by way of cell division. 
and that requires a lot of energy. But producing new cells also requires something else. It requires raw materials, one of the most important of which is protein. Producing protein is a major function of cells throughout their life, and it's controlled from within the nucleus. The chromosomes that we saw in mitosis contain a substance called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It can be represented like this, a double helix of molecules linked together. The links are molecules called bases, and there are four different ones, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. But in fact, because of their chemical structure, they always form the same pairs, adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine. The order of the base pairs on the DNA forms a code, and it's that code which controls the manufacture of protein. The process happens like this. Part of the double helix of DNA separates. Clusters of molecules called nucleotides are brought together to make a copy of a section of the DNA strand, with one small change. On the copy, the thymine is replaced by another base, uracil. The new strand of molecules formed is known as messenger RNA, ribonucleic acid, and it's sent out from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. There, the messenger RNA joins up with another type of organelle, a ribosome. They form a sort of production line to put together groups of amino acids. Note that the order of the bases determines which amino acid takes its place along the line. The amino acids link up. Different amino acids create different proteins. And there are thousands of different proteins used for making everything from hair to muscles, leaves to flowers. By controlling protein synthesis in this way, DNA controls the whole life of the cell. So, as the basic units of life, cells hold the key to all life's processes. As we said at the beginning, the body is made up of cells. If anything goes wrong with the body, it can be traced back to cell level. So understanding the way cells work and the ways they can go wrong will help us to overcome illness and disease. Take this beastie we saw earlier, the trypanosome. It's a parasite that can cause a serious illness called sleeping sickness in people. It's passed on by the tsetse fly. Once the parasite has got into the human bloodstream, it feeds on nutrients in the blood, moves around the body, and will multiply rapidly by cell division. Scientists are studying the life cycle of the trypanosome. If they can find a way of stopping the cell division, they may be on the way to a cure for a disease that affects thousands of people in hot countries. Understanding the biology of that single cell is vital to that search.